excited because we're starting to move into uh, the rest of this book and the next book, 2 Thessalonians. We're, we're getting some, uh, some prophecy stuff, some end time stuff too. So I'm really excited about that and looking forward to it and um, looking to these end time things. I know we're all super interested in that nowadays because it feels like uh, the time is ripe, you know, <laughs> the apple's getting ripe on the tree. Um, so I'm looking forward to that and, and looking forward to just the transition between what we were talking about before and persecution and that type of stuff and, and working our way toward that, toward these great promises that God has for us and that Paul's going to walk us through. So today um, we're going to start to talk about how we should always continue to move forward in our, in our relationship this isn't until it's over. Yeah? I love that. Mickey. <laughs> was that Mickey? No, that was Yogi Berra. Thank you. Oh. It's not over till it's over. Yep. Love that. Yeah, so no matter of life you're in, there's always more that can be done. You know, we serve an infinite God. Infinite. So we never arrive at anything. He's always continuing to do this great work in us. And you know, I was just talking, gosh, I was talking to a guy about this um, last week because he's uh, early 60s and he's just feel, felt like he's um, kind of put off the things of God in his life and hasn't, um, you know, uh, cultivated it to its full potential. Like he felt like God was doing things in his life, but then he walked away and kind of got slack. And it just never came to fruition. And I said, you know, a lot of times, if you look at the great patriarchs of the Bible, they're old. Some of them are really old before God actually does these. I mean, most guys 80 to 100 years old before God actually does the work that he's going to do in them. Because it takes a time of preparation in our lives to actually get us to where God wants us to be. No matter how old we are, um, no matter how much we've been through, there's this time specifically to train us what he's going to do in it. And we saw that in Paul's life as well. I mean, from the time that he hits public ministry actually starts, I mean, we're talking a time of three years or so, right? That he just spends with the Lord and the Lord training him up. So you have this time always that God doing that in your life for whatever reason, whether it's to, to grow you in your faith, make you faithful, to show you that he's your one and only and to really get you to trust in him or whatever that is, it's different for all of us. But to actually do in your life what he wants to do, to start to, to cultivate that relationship to show you what he's going to do in it. So last week, our chapter ended, chapter three, ended with the realization that God is in control and he takes care of us because Paul was so freaked out that the enemy was going to come and steal away from the Thessalonians what he cultivate, what he had planted and watered. And then all of the hard work and dedication and faithfulness to the gospel would be in vain. One thing that Paul forgot was that God is also faithful. God also does a work in each one of us idea the last couple of weeks because the God is every day of our lives and we've talked about this before just that he's drawn us in and moved us forward in our lives and put every situation every relationship every person in our life to get us to this point so that we would be here for him to do his work in us and in his word that it's his job to move us forward and and it's written all over the scripture. One plants, another waters, but God brings the increase. One plants, one waters, God brings the increase. God is in the business of increase. You ever realize that about God? He's in the business of bringing increase. And it's just like we were talking about about Friday night in that great time of worship that we had in that filling, that anointing of the Spirit. Nobody did that. It wasn't anything that any experience that 
And it wasn't any, it was not cake. Even though it does amp us up a little bit, but it was so different, right? It was so much different. God brings that increase. God does that work. There's nothing we can do. And I know a lot of times in Christianity and in church, we try to bring that increase. We try to create that experience with God for the constituents, for, for the fellowship, for the people to have that experience because we know how inspiring it is when God does something special like that. But the thing is, you can't create it. You can't do anything about it. God does it when he desires to do it. And that's what makes it so special because if he did it every week, it wouldn't be special. But when he does it, when it's unexpected and nobody's done anything, he just times it up and makes it special for each person there. And everybody realizes it too. So God is in the business of increase. He can take just a tiny act of faith and multiply it 10, 20, 50, 100 times. It says he does that. He, he, our acts of faithfulness, he will multiply 100 times in this life and in the next. He says he will do that. So God is in the business of increase. And you know, it strikes me because I'm kind of a, a wannabe gardener in a way. I'm terrible at it. But I think I'm really good. And that is always a recipe for disaster, right? I think I'm really good and I know what I'm doing. And then I realize, wow, I really have no idea what I'm doing here. But, you know, I can plant something and I can water it. But I have a really hard time bringing increase. I do. I don't know if I'm just doing it wrong or what. Or if I just need to pray over these plants or what. Sing, uh, sing. Uh, uh, yes, there you go. They sing respond to singing. Them. Yes, I will sing to them when I get home tonight. <laughs> you know, a lot of us know how to do that, though. A lot of us know how to plant stuff. A lot of us know how to water stuff. But does anybody actually know what makes something increase? Does anybody... Can anybody look at a plant and say, grow, and it obeys you? Nobody can do that. That's God's job. That's what he does. So if you look around us, you see tons of plants, you see tons of things that increase, but you have no idea what actually makes it increase, what actually makes it grow. And you know, I picked up something. I was blowing the leaves on my front porch. I found a few of these. We have oak trees around our house, and this is an acorn. And I don't know if you guys can see it from where you're at, but right here on the tip of it, it's split apart, and it's starting to grow out of there. This was on top of the ground, on the grass, and it just started to grow like that. And I thought to myself, man, that is incredible. This whole time, I've been planting things in the ground and expecting them to grow, and they just grow on top of the ground like this. I know. Oh, I just lost it. There you go. Killing things. Yes. But you see my point here. We put, this acorn was dead, right? It fell off the tree. When things fall off the tree, that pretty much means it's dead. This acorn fell off the tree, landed on the ground, and we can take something like this, put it in dirt, which is dead, right? There's no life in dirt. But yet we take something that's dead, put it in something that has no life, and somehow it grows. Somehow increase happens with a little bit of moisture. How does that happen? God does this. God has designed the world to do this. But it, he still gets the credit for it. It says he brings the increase. And man, I'm just so struck by that because I know in our everyday lives, we do this all the time. We plant, we water, and then we worry about it. And that's always, you know, a, a, a great growing process, right? Plant, water, and worry, and then things happen, right? We do that. We do that with our kids. We do that with our families. We do, do that with people that we share the gospel with. We plant, we water, and then we worry about it like crazy, hoping that God is going to do something with it. That's exactly, I mean, I'm guilty. Totally guilty. Yes. Completely guilty of this. 
But Paul was too here with the Thessalonians. He had planted, he had watered, and then he worried and hoped that something was going to happen out of that. But you see, God was faithful in it. God was still there with them doing these incredible things in their midst that he had prepared them for even before, and we're going to get into this, even before they knew him, he had done this work in the Thessalonians' life, which I find is incredible. But my whole point here is that our job is not to bring increase. Our job is to plant and to water. And then we just let God do what he does. Yeah, when it comes to worship, one can practice all he wants. One can really work hard and get people around him that are working hard too and are, are great singers and great musicians. But what does that amount to if we're doing it on our own power? Not a whole heck of a lot. But when God brings that increase, man, something special happens. It really does. And he can do it in any one of us. Okay. I have this verse, and I sent this to Marissa the other day. I have no idea why I sent it to her. But I was talking, I was a conversation with this other gentleman that I told you that felt like he, um, you know, wasn't doing what the Lord was asking him to do was the fact that his children, he felt responsible for them. In teaching them and in training them, he had dropped his responsibility in that area of his life. But in, just in my daily reading, this is the way God, do, God works things. In my daily reading, I'm in Isaiah, and this comes from Isaiah 54. It says, All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. How amazing is that? And that connects to this because Paul was, in, in all these places, he even says this in a few of his letters, like, I feel like you're my children. Like I'm responsible for you in that way. And here in Isaiah comes the answer. It's God's job to teach those people. It's God's job to teach our children. Yes, we can plant and we can water, and that's a great thing. We can still pray for them, and that we should. We really should continue to pray for these people. But it's God's job to do that work, and he's going to do it. He knows that it's his job, and he has never slacked on it ever. He has never once dropped the ball and said, you know, I really haven't done what I should have done. No, no, no. God is working in each of our lives all the time. And working all these things out, all the situations, all the people we meet, to bring that increase. And he wants to do it in each one of us. God is so faithful, and he will see it through to the end. He's an incredible multitasker. He definitely gave that to women more than he did to men. What was that person, Isaiah? <clears throat> Isaiah 54, 13. Yep, so good. Yeah. We can all find rest in that verse, huh? Yeah. We can identify with it and just really have rest in that. Thank you, God. Okay, verse 1 in 1 Thessalonians 4 says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk to please God, just as you were doing, that you do so more and more. You see, God gives us all grace differently. For some of us, the and we, even if we don't have a relationship with him, God has written that on our heart. God has already put the things in our life to grow us in the sanctification process before we come into relationship with him. He's in us. And that's what we see here with the Thessalonians because as we look at Paul's letters in the, the that he writes to all kinds of different people, we don't see this all the time. We don't see him giving praise to people all the time. We don't see him acknowledging how God has already worked in their life in such a way that we do in the th in first and in second Thessalonians. Like he is just praising them for the work that God has already done in them, even though they're a brand new church, which means to 
God has been cultivating this in their life before they even knew him. Before they even took that step relationally and said, God, I want to be in relationship with you. God was already doing this work in them and in a great way. God does this in each one of our lives. He works in us no matter if we're in relationship with him or not. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. So he knows, but still, he, okay, let me expound upon that. He knows whether we're going to come into relationship with him or not, but he still does this work in each one of our lives to give us all an equal opportunity to come to him in the best opportunity. Ultimately, we all have to make that decision for ourselves whether we're going to, because if we push God away, he's not going to say, no, you're coming with me. No, he's doing that and cultivating that in our life to give us all that opportunity to say yes to him. So God is going to continue to do that in our family's lives. God is going to continue to do that in the people that we speak the gospel to. He's going to do that in every one of our lives, no matter what. So we continue to pray for these people. And as we pray for them, we now can have the faith to say, no, God is going to do this work. God is going to do his work. We can plant, we can water, but now we have the faith to say, God is going to bring that increase in the way that he sees fit. Is that going to be that everyone grows up in the Lord and becomes this great person of God that goes around preaching the gospel to everyone that they meet? No. I'll tell you straight up, that's not going to happen. But that doesn't mean that God isn't working in it. That doesn't mean that God hasn't brought an increase in some way, shape, or form. No, he's done it. He's done that work. So allow God to continue to do that work. Allow your faith to say, hey, you know what, God? I'm going to give this to you. I'm not going to plant water and worry. I'm going to plant water and have faith to know that you're going to do this work and do it mightily because he will do it. And sometimes even in a greater way than what we thought, just like with the Thessalonians here, God had already done that work. And by worldly standards, even before they met the Lord, I'm sure they were good people because God had already done that work in their life. But that doesn't mean that we should stop there as just good people. And that's what Paul is saying in verse one. Okay, by worldly standards, yes, you guys are good people, but continue in the sanctification process to do what God is doing in your life. Because as we all know, in, in today's world, if you're a good person by worldly standards, it really doesn't mean a whole lot. It really doesn't mean a whole lot. And actually, it's meaning less and less by the day because we're seeing that in our world that we're starting to go that direction. People are starting to call good things bad and bad things good. So if bad things are called good, then it really doesn't mean a whole lot to be called a good person in this day and age. So just because you're a good person by worldly standards doesn't mean you're a good person by godly standards because it all comes down to who we're comparing ourselves against. If we compare ourselves against the axe murderers out there of the world, of course, of course we look good. We look really good. But what does that mean to you? Is that really all you want to be is better than an axe murderer? No, no. We're called to be way more than that. But the world says, oh, okay, I'm not as bad as some people, so I must be good enough. No, not even close to good enough. Nothing to do with that. It's simply whether or not we put faith in Jesus Christ or not. That's the only way we get to heaven. That's it. 100% good or bad person. The only way you get to heaven is putting your faith in Jesus Christ. So call yourself a good person, person all you want. You're still not going to heaven unless you say no. You're my God. You're my Lord. And I'm going to heaven because of you, because of your righteousness that you've imparted upon me. That's it. So if you're a better person than the lowest of the low, but yet you compare yourself to Jesus Christ, you're going to come up wanting. You're going to come up 
seeing Jesus in all of his righteousness. I mean, we're talking about a guy that was tested in every way as we are, yet without sin, perfect in all of his ways. And he says, if you're not as good as God, you're not going to enter into heaven. You're not going to have the righteousness of heaven because heaven is perfection. And we touched on this last week, the sanctification process that God is leading us to so that we can be in that heavenly body with him and not care about the world so much, but see the perfection of heaven and all that it is and all of its glory. Most people out there believe that they are a good person, especially when they look at this world. And I think that's most of our testimonies as well. Irene and I were talking about this the other day. Boring. In the fact that we were not, never like addicted to hard drugs or you know, killed people in prison time or anything like that. But realistically, that's most of our testimonies. Most of our testimonies are that we were good people by the world standards that called out and is trying to do this sanctification process past that and showing us how wretched inside we actually were, but yet the world was calling us good. And we were calling ourselves good. But then God was saying, you know what? You think you're good, but let me show you me. Let me show you my purity. Let me show you my sanctification here, my sanctity. And you will see just how wretched you actually are. Because that's what happens to each one of us. As we read through the Bible, as we come into relationship with God, we see how wretched we actually are. And then all of a sudden, we become, we become so grateful that we have a Savior who is perfect in every single way. And then would give that to us and say, you know what? I want, I want you anyway. No matter what, no matter what you've done or where you've been, I want you anyway. Because that's what he's saying to each of us. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and yet he loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And I love this verse. It says, he who, has become a, he who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He has started a good work in you, but it's just the start. And that's what Paul is saying to these Thessalonians. Yeah, this is great. What you guys are doing is really good, but it's just the start. It's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, God desires to sanctify us all. And that word sanctify means to consecrate you. To consecrate you. I'm smiling at you. <laughs> Zephaniah 1.7 says, be silent before the Lord your God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. He has consecrated us all, and he desires to consecrate us. That also means to purify. He desires to purify our ways, and therefore we will be with him in our purest state, in our heavenly state. That's what he's talking about in Zephaniah. He has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. He has purified his guests. That's who we are. That's the work that he desires to do in each one of us. He desires that all his guests would be purified, holy, and without blemish. And that's the work that he's doing in each one of us. That is the increase that he's bringing in each one of us. Yeah, someone could plant and someone could water, and that may bring a, a uh, conversion for Christ. That may bring a conversion of your heart. But ultimately, God desires to bring more increase in your heart than just that. God desires to grow you bigger than that. If that's all he can get out, out of you, like the criminal on the cross, all he could get out of you was a confession of faith, a confession of his lordship, then great, he'll take it. But man, to us who are still here on the earth and have more time than that, he desires something much greater. He desires us to know him in his fullness, in all of his sanctification. And so he does that process in us. Ephesians 5.27, I love this verse. 
It tells us that Christ desires to present the church to himself in splendor, holy and without blemish. In that part of Ephesians 5, Paul is talking about our relationship as husband and wife. How we would present ourselves to Christ as he presents the church to himself in splendor, holy and without blemish. That's what he desires to do. And he is going to do that work both in good people by worldly standards and in bad people by worldly standards. He's going to do that work in each one of us because he's not just the God of those who think they need him. He's the God over everyone. He's the God of us all. So whether you think you're a good person and you don't need God or whether you know you're a bad person and you know you need God, he's going to do that work in each one of us. Whether you think you need him or not, every knee one day is going to bow to him. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we, as his church, will be there looking on because Jesus Christ was faith, faithful to sanctify us, each one of us, until the day of his arrival. That's the work that he's doing in each one of us. And therefore, we will be with him in our sanctified, purified state looking on as every knee will bow to him and every tongue will confess to him that he is Lord. So thank you, God, that you are Lord and that you are Lord over each one of our lives. Not just good people, not just bad people, but every person, because one day every knee will bow to you, God. Every tongue will confess to you. And people will cry out as they hide in caves for rocks and mountains to fall upon them to hide them from the day of the Lord. But none can hide from you, God. Whether I descend into the depths of Sheol, I cannot hide from you. Where can I run from your presence, God? There is no place, for you are in it all. You inhabit it all. And your presence is there. And we thank you that your presence abides in us and that you lead us every day. We thank you and praise you, God, for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord.